This is the location where the event took place in Genesis chapter 6. I call it the Genesis 6 experiment. And an individual named David Flynn realized that that location is 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian and 33.33 degrees north. Interesting. How many fell with Satan? How many angels fell with Satan? One third, 33.33 percent. Kind of interesting that they landed on the only geographical landmass, at least on the Mercator projection, that just so happens to match their numbers perfectly, 33.33 by 33.33. He also noted, it's kind of interesting, that it was 30, 2012 nautical miles from the Paris Prime Meridian and 2012 nautical miles to the equator, which caused a lot of people to speculate about. Remember all the craze about 2012? That maybe something might happen? Who knows? But it was definitely interesting. This is Mount Hermon today. This is what the range looks like there. We see in Genesis chapter 6, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. The same were the mighty men which were of old, the men of renown. Genesis 6, 4. Now, this is a hotly debated topic actually. Who were the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6? Seminaries teach people that the sons of God were the sons of Seth. And the daughters of men were the daughters of Cain. doesn't say that, but that's what they say. Well, if you look at other ancient texts that the same Hebrew people wrote, you see Genesis says sons of God. You see Enoch tells you actually in the same verse synchronized perfectly. First Enoch chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 pairing up with Genesis 6, 1 and 2. And the angels, the children of heaven, the book of Jubilees again announces them as the angels of God we see that there is absolutely nothing in Genesis 6 which in any way refers to Seth or Cain or their offspring. Rather, the phrase sons of God is a reference applied to the angels just as it was in the book of Job, which actually predates Genesis. We see in Job 38, when he's talking about the creation account, when the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, stars are singing. There's one of those references, sentient beings. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Question, were the alleged good sons of Seth there at the time of creation? No. So Moses is writing in the context of the understood idiom of his day that the sons of God was a reference to angels. Canonized internal witnesses for the Enochian angelic view of the Genesis 6 experiment include in Genesis 6, Moses mentions Nephilim with no further need of elaboration, which presupposes that A, he knows what the Nephilim were and that his audience did also. So that's an internal evidence we could look at. He also uses the same idiom for angels, sons of God, as Job. In Leviticus 16, we see the scapegoat, is what your King James says, and some of the other translations probably too, is really sent out to Azazel, a proper name, if you look it up in Hebrew. A character found in the book of Enoch, to whom all sin was ascribed. Hence, on the Day of Atonement, the Israelites laid hands on the goat, placing their sin on it, and sent it out into the wilderness. This is also Isaiah, what's it, 118, I think this is the verse. Though my sins be are scarlet, they are made white as snow. The ritual was they would lay their hands on the goat, they would tie a scarlet ribbon around its horns, they would cut a piece of it off, send the goat out, and put a piece, that piece of the ribbon up on the temple door, and overnight it would change from scarlet red to white, showing that God had accepted their offering. Interesting fact, that didn't happen for 40 years leading up to the destruction of the temple. For 40 years it didn't change, and the doors that were closed would burst wide open overnight and all kinds of stuff that the rabbis wrote about. What do you think happened 40 years prior to the destruction of the, tap, uh, of the temple? Yeshua. Interesting how they <laughs> don't put that together, right? Interesting. Uh, we see numerous descriptions of giants throughout the Old Testament. Of course, Numbers 13, Amos 2 most notably, uh, along with uh, you know, Goliath, Og, Bashan, etc. Both Peter and Jude reference angels that sinned, who are bound in chains, is cast into the prison called Tartarus. Now, there's no other precedence for that anywhere. The angel, we know that Satan is out and about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and that he has principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness that are still in operation out here. So who are the angels that are bound and put in Tartarus? You have no frame of reference for what Peter and Jude are referring to if you throw out the book of Enoch. 
among other statements found in the canonized text, which again also find no precedence anywhere else but the book of Enoch, and other texts which affirm it. We have also uh, external Jewish slash Roman slash Greek understanding. For instance, the uh, Jewish historian, who, uh, who Josephus, who was also a, uh, you know, conscripted by the Romans to do his thing there, uh, he said, For many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good on account of the confidence they had in their strength. For the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians called giants or the titans. He identifies the first generation Nephilim as the titans of Greek mythology. Uh, and uh, that's in the Antiquity of the Jews, book 1, chapter 3. In book 5, chapter 2.3, he says, For which reason they removed their camp to Hebron, and when they had taken it, they slew all the inhabitants. There were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. And there are many other such testimonies as that. Uh, kissing cousins don't produce 20-footers, <laughs> just FYI. <laughs> you know, I don't care how much spinach you feed these people. Uh, in my second book, Archon Invasion, uh, I point out uh, in the book of Enoch, First Enoch chapter 6, it, it says that 200 watchers landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared, and the book names the leaders right there. You see the leaders there in yellow. These are archons. Archons, a Greek word, just simply means chief, ruler, commander, somebody in a position of authority. These were the leaders over the 200. And these are also the angels that sinned and left their first estate. We see in 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, and, and being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. That's ESV. I think King James says that he preached to those in prison. Uh, I, I think both of those are lacking. If you look up the Greek word there for pro proclaimed or preached, um, oh, I just forgot what it was. I think it's um, Caruso, I think, if I remember right, but whatever it was, it, it's heralded in victory. Like, the way I see it, he went down there and said, Aha, I win, you lose. <laughs> I'm taking the keys, and by the way, I'll be back, and it's not going to be good for you. See ya. You know, because they made an attempt to try to get rid of him back there in Genesis chapter 6, corrupting all flesh and preventing the seed from being born. Second Peter 2, 4. If, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them into hell, the Greek word there is actually Tartarus, and when you look into the Greek um, understanding of Tartarus, that was the prison of their gods, the Titans, prison of the gods, the Titans, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Jude 6, and the angels which kept not the first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So I like timelines. I like to try to put things together and uh, visualize them. And when did these things happen? To the best of my understanding with the research that I've done, I believe the Genesis 6 experiment took place in roughly 3550 B.C. And the book of Enoch said that the first generation, Nephilim, would only live for 500 years. And within that time period, they were to kill each other off. This is what the Greeks later stylized into what became known as the Clash of the Titans. The Clash of the Titans ended just prior to about 3000 B.C. Part three, Genesis 6 and the pre-flood return of the Nephilim. A lot of people talk about the return of the Nephilim after the flood, but I submit to you that there was a return of the Nephilim before the flood. And the reason I say that is because as I started to look at what I now call the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text of Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees, comparing them with the narrative in Genesis, I find that when you, you pair them all up together, they, they fill in a lot of blanks and tell a very detailed and elaborate story of what was happening. I'm just going to look at one piece of it right here. And Genesis 6, 1 through 4, Genesis talks about angels mating with humans. That syncs up with the text that you see, see there in red. Genesis 6, 5 through 7 shows that God, how God feels about the resulting violence, again, syncing up with what you see there. Genesis 6, 8 through 10 reveals how Noah and his sons were genetically pure. It says that Noah was found righteous in his generations. The Hebrew word used there is tamim. Same word used for the red heifer, the pure red heifer without spot or blemish and whatnot. So he was pure in his genetics. The extra-biblical texts tell you that he married uh, Enoch's daughter. 
Enoch was so righteous, God took him home, right? Said, come with me, bro. That's uh, my slang. So it's, it stands to reason that she was a good pick, right? So if Noah and his wife were both genetically pure, then it stands to reason that his three sons were likewise genetically pure. Are you with me so far? Okay. Then we get to Genesis 6, 11 through 12, and it says, Earth and how much flesh? All flesh had become corrupted. Now, I believe that all is with the exception of the prior verses that just established that this family is genetically pure. Okay? Everything else seemed to become corrupted. Genesis 6, and that syncs up with the text that you see there in red. Genesis 6, 13 through 17, God grows increasingly angry and tells Noah to build the ark and how to do it. And I'm going to stop right here and say, you know, some people, I've heard some videos, people coming out and saying the book of Enoch is heresy and it contradicts the Bible, supposedly. And one of the things that they'll use to say that is they say, well, Enoch said angels helped Noah build the ark. So, so therefore, you know, it's, it's false. Well, go back and read Genesis. God just tells Noah how to build the ark. He says, okay, I'm putting you in charge of building this thing. He didn't put him in, he didn't limit his subcontractors. <laughs> there was no specification on who could help him or who couldn't. You know, we naturally assume that probably his sons did, and maybe they did. But Enoch says, yeah, the angels helped him. I don't have any problem with that. Noah was put in charge, and uh, he had some subcontractors help him out. Uh, and then we get to Genesis 6.18, and we find the first mention of the wives of Noah's three sons. Quick quiz. Which comes first, 18 or 12? 12. So 18 follows 12, right? So if Noah and his wife are pure and his three sons are pure and there's no mention anywhere of angels coming back and doing the dirty deed again, what do we have left? I submit to you that these three wives may be suspicious based on verse 12. Joshua tells you that they didn't even pick the three wives for the three sons until seven days before the flood, the same day Methuselah died. So they had a funeral and a wedding the same day. And you also note that the wife's family didn't make it on the ark either. None of their siblings and their parents made it on the ark. Okay, so let's look at Genesis 6.12 just a little bit more here. God, Genesis 6.12 says, God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. How did that happen? Well, we get a lot of detail in these other books. Joshua 4.18 says, And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt. For how much? All flesh had corrupted its ways on the earth, all men and all animals. We see a backup second witness to that in Jubilees 7.24. And after this, the after this of Jubilees 7.24 is the after that of Genesis 6.4. Genesis 6.4 says, and after that, that's this. That is when the angels came down, made it with the daughters of men. After that, they sinned against the beasts and birds and all that moveth and walketh on the earth. And much blood was shed on the earth. And every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. That was the byproduct of blending species. There's an interesting uh, episode of Ancient Aliens. I think it was called Alien Breeders. And in this episode, David Wilcock was talking about a scientific study that was done on the human genome. And they said... Something happened to the human genome about 3000 BC, sometime around 3000 BC. And now they, they said that they changed human DNA by as much as 7%. And I'm going, wow, isn't that amazing? Because my research led me to the exact same conclusion that something was going on around that exact same time. We had all this watcher activity, Nephilim activity, 3000 BC, Noah's born, and I came to expand the definition of Nephilim. A lot of people will look at the definition of Nephilim and just say, well, if angels mate with humans, you get Nephilim. Yes, that's certainly true. But I, as I was contemplating these things, I had these two books sitting on my desk in that order. Douglas Hamp's book, Corrupting the Image, and Tom Horn's book, Forbidden Gates. And I'm like, wow, what if that's the formula? When we corrupt the image, the perfect image that God created and called good and very good, we start messing around with it. Could it be that we are opening forbidden gates, creating Nephilim? Fallen entities, entities that have fallen from the original design, the original creation, that which was from the original state. As I was thinking about that, 
Unfortunately, we couldn't get this video to play. The Mac wouldn't recognize the codec, but uh, this is a video that I usually show here is from the movie Spider-Man, the one where he fights the lizard. You guys see that movie where his bat, the enemy, the bad guy, was a lizard? In this movie, this guy who was actually a good guy. He's a doctor. He had lost a part of his arm in, an, uh, in a combat scenario, and he was trying to figure out what's the deal with lizards. Why, can, why is it that lizards can have their tails cut off and they grow back. What is the genetic code for limb regeneration? If he could figure that out, he could grow his arm back, and then he could help lots of people, that, you know, other amputees and people with various problems. You know, that'd be a good. He starts out with good intentions, and he starts experimenting with mice and cutting off their legs and injecting them with lizard DNA until finally he gets a viable subject, and the, and the mouse's leg grows back. And aha! All right, awesome. And then he can't wait, so he decides to inject him, his stump. And sure enough, his, his arm grows back. But he has an unfortunate side effect. He becomes, for the rest of the movie, a giant lizard-human hybrid that has only evil continually in his heart and mind and becomes the enemy of Spider-Man in that particular episode. And I'm like, wow. Th that's exactly what happened in the ancient record. When they started blending species, what the result was evil and violence continually. So this brings us to part four, the post-flood return of the Nephilim. If angels didn't come back, how did the Nephilim return? Because we know that there were giants in the post-flood world, right? How did that happen? Well, this is why Genesis 6 does not support the idea of what I call multiple incursions. Many other researchers out there that you may be familiar with will talk about multiple incursions that angels came back and continued to mate with women based on the phrase and also after that right here in Genesis 6-4. Uh, I disagree with that. It says, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days. What days? The days of Jared. And also after that, what's the that? The days of Jared. When the sons of God came unto the daughters of men. When? In the days of Jared. And they bare children to them, the same who were born in the days of Jared, not Noah, were the mighty men that were of old. The Hebrew word used there is olam. It's the same word that's translated elsewhere as forever and everlasting, like hundreds of times. In other words, a very, very long time ago, not last week when we saw the Canaanites in Israel, the men of renown, Genesis 6, 4. One of the reasons that I don't believe that the angels came back and made it with women again is because God was very thorough in the judgment. It was an extremely severe judgment. And I covered this in my DVD that's out there called the Mount Hermon Roswell Connection. The judgment against the watchers was extremely severe to the point where Michael, the archangel himself, when looking at what's happening, I mean, next to the Godhead, there's no one tougher than Michael. I mean, he's the one that takes out Lucifer, right? I mean, he's, he's the big guy right up there. It says, Michael's looking at the judgment that's taking place, and he says, I am trembling at the severity of what I'm seeing here. And he prophesies. He says, no one's ever going to do that again. I mean, you'd have to be like dumb and dumber on steroids to, <laughs> let's do what they did, you know, do the same thing, because you're going to receive the same judgment. The judgment was extremely severe. There's no confirming scriptures or any other text that says angels ever came back and did it again. Size began to drop dramatically. The original angel-human hybrids, uh, it says they got to uh, 400, uh, 300 L's. 300 L's, and Dr. A. Nyland, in her translation of uh, the Book of Enoch, says that that's equivalent to 450 feet. I find that interesting because 450 feet is the same dimensions as the length of the ark. So the ark was like a big casket-looking thing, <laughs> the size of the titans. Uh, after that, giants started to decrease dramatically in size over time. The world became completely corrupt as a result of the activity of Genesis chapter 6 and following. Well, they've had five times that amount of time to completely corrupt everything. If, if I'm a military commander and I send 200 soldiers in on a campaign and they are able to utterly destroy everything to the point where all things are so corrupt and you know to the point where God's like okay I'm gonna have to start over again what would you do afterwards man I'd be like send 400 <laughs> you know let's send everybody let's just go ahead and get in there right I mean he was extremely effective the first time we should have been completely corrupted five times over and then why science instead of sex why is it that all these alien abduction scenarios uh, deal with scientific experiments. We're not talking about copulation anymore. We're talking about women being abducted and implanted with seed and uh, having fetuses and embryos and stuff like that implanted and removed. It's all very scientific. There's no uh, sex again like there was in uh, Genesis chapter 6. 
Just some of the few reasons why I don't believe that. Angels came back again. This is the judgment that was imposed upon them. It says, And to Gabriel said the Lord, Proceed against the bastards and the reprobates and against the children of fornication and destroy the children of the watchers from amongst men. Send them one against the other that they may destroy each other in battle. For length of days shall they not have. And no request that they make of thee shall be granted unto the fathers on their behalf. For they hope to live an eternal life. And that each one of them, the Nephilim offspring, will live 500 years. And the Lord said unto Michael, Go and bind some Jaza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons, the Nephilim offspring, have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, the angels loved their children. They referred to them as their beloved ones. How many parents are there in the audience here? How many of you would like to see your children obliterate each other and massacre each other? Anybody? No, of course not. That was part of their severe judgment, was having to watch their own children, their beloved ones, kill each other. That was the step one of their judgment. And then they were to be bound fast, the watchers, for 70 generations, remember that, 70 generations in the valleys of the earth till the day of their judgment and of their consummation till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. So, again, I love to make timelines. This is a timeline chart that I made for the 350 post-flood years of Noah's life. How many of you know he lived 950 years, right? 600 years before the flood, 350 years after the flood. Well, Moses, the same guy who wrote Genesis 6, wrote Genesis 9. And in Genesis 9, he says, And the sons of Noah, this is after the flood, that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Why did he just throw that in there? Oh, by the way, Ham's the father of Canaan. So what? What's the purpose of that? He says, These are the three sons of Noah, and what? Of them was the whole earth overspread or populated. So J Moses just told you the whole earth after the flood was populated by these three people right here. So, interesting things that uh, you can look at when we look at Canaan in particular. Again, Ham is the father of Canaan, right? Well, Genesis chapter 10 is what they call the table of nations where they say who begat who and, and you know, all the people groups that came out of after the flood from the three sons of Noah. Genesis 10 beginning in verse 15. And Canaan begat Sidon, his first son, and, uh, his firstborn, and Heth, who was the father of the Hittites, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Ar Arvidite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, and afterwards were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. Well, coincidentally... Those are the same people groups that over and over and over again you see in the Old Testament. God says, utterly destroy them. Wipe them out. See the same names there? Now, you have to say, you know, either God is prejudiced and into random acts of genocide and schizophrenic, or he's got a legitimate reason for singling out these very specific groups for utter destruction. Kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, everything. Wipe it all out. In some cases, don't even eat the food. So why is it that during you know, warfare, I mean, typically in, in combat scenarios, especially back in that day, you know, they could keep the women and children and, and animals as spoils of war. And there were various campaigns where the Israelites did that. But anytime they went up against these gods, God's saying, wipe them all out. This was something that used to be a big sticking point for me growing up. Because you read the Old Testament and it seems like God's this genocidal maniac, right? You get to the New Testament and, you know, the disciples are talking with him and he's like, hey, Philip, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. That didn't compute in my head. Because Jesus is this amazing, loving guy, love your enemies, all that stuff, right? There, there's dad like, ah, kill the women, kill the children, wipe out everything. And he's saying, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen my dad. How's that work? You know? I couldn't understand that, and that tripped me up, and that trips a lot of people up. A lot of people trying to get through the Old Testament. I mean, you're, you're here in Deuteronomy and Joshua and some of these early books of the Old Testament. You don't get very far until you start seeing these things, and you're like, what is up with this guy? What is up with this God? And it's a hindrance to a lot of people. As I started doing this teaching, I started getting a lot of phone calls and emails and letters from atheists and agnostics, former atheists now and agnostics, because this opened up some things for them and cleared it up. Like God is actually, this is an act of mercy for his true creation that he created in his image and his likeness. He is wiping out the bad seed here that was not meant to exist in the first place. Let's look a little bit further. 
Meaning of names. How many of you have seen this before? The definition, the Hebrew words of the, of the names up there? Uh, first time I heard it, Dr. Chuck Missler put it together. He's looking at the meaning of the names of the patriarchs right there before the flood. And he put it together in a sentence. And it says, man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Dude, that's like the entire plan of God right there in the names of the pre-flood patriarchs. How crazy cool is that, right? Well, I mean, you look at some of these names, especially starting with Jared we're talking about here. His name means shall come down. Well, that's when the watchers came down during the days of Jared. Enoch's name means teaching. Well, he taught against the watchers. Methuselah says with his death shall bring, and the, and the connotation there is judgment. He died seven days later. The flood starts. Lamech is born, and, and his dad names him Despairing. Well, Lamech is born right in the middle of the Clash of the Titans. Can you imagine how chaotic that might have been? 400 footers wiping each other out and stuff. Now, we have a hard time conceiving of that, but the Greeks didn't. Many ancient cultures didn't. Hollywood doesn't. You go see the movie Clash of the Titans, and they're trying to resurrect Kronos, right? And they bring Kronos up, and what is he, a 400-foot giant? You know, that's what the ancients believed. Uh, but after the Clash of the Titans, uh, and their judge bound and buried, about 68 years or so, 70, give or take, uh, Noah's born, and his dad names him Rest. Well, that just makes sense. It was after the Clash of the Titans. So when you take the names of the sons of Ham in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20, these are the meanings of their names. <laughs> Look at some of those. Now, parents, let me ask you, what would, what would possess the proud parents of a newborn baby to turn to their spouse and say, hmm, enclosure of wrath, what do you think, honey? <laughs> yeah, that's a good name. Terror! <laughs> you know, there is something clearly wrong with these children for them to receive names like that. And then when you put them together in a Chuck Mister like uh, paragraph, this is what you end up with. He raged, a black terror, double straight afflicted trafficker. Interesting, the Canaanites were traffickers. I had a hard time figuring out what is the deal with that until I started watching the news lately. What are we seeing a lot of? Human trafficking. I really do believe that there's another bloodline out there. It's not the same as you and I. You know, we, we look at some of these atrocities and we say, who could do that? I mean, who in their right mind? Well, we don't think that way. We're not wired that way. And yet, clearly, there's a whole group of people out there who are wired that way. And it just so happens that Canaan's name means trafficker. Huh. Black terror, drink thou anguish, compass the chamber, thunder, compass the smiting, he who is coming, their love, we shall rebel. That's Nimrod right there. Nimrod is the we shall rebel. A double straight firebrand, travailing, affliction of water, blades opening the moistened morsel, forgiven ones bowing to spy, a trafficker hunting terrors, trodden downsayers, the tr strangers draw near, showers of life gnawing like thorns, they shall break loose, double woolen, enclosures of wrath. That's an interesting family tree right there. <laughs> By contrast to the family that we saw, you know, with the, the patriarchs that God was working with. So that says to me, something's going on in that family, <laughs> you know. Now, how big were the giants? How tall were they in the post-flood world? Well, this is a graphic I did quite some time ago to depict based on both the biblical text as well as uh, ancient historical texts and archaeological finds throughout history. Uh, you got like a six-foot average man down there. You, you, Goliath is, depending on who you read, usually between nine and 12 feet tall. Some people, I just got in a big debate on Facebook. The person was saying, you know, he's only about six foot four. I'm like, then what the heck was wrong with Saul and the entire Israelite army? Like, I'm just shy of six feet tall, right? Robbie's taller than that, you know? Really? Oh, David and Goliath, it always is not much of a story if you're talking about, you know, somebody shorter than seven feet tall. Wow, come on, man. No, nine to 12 feet for Goliath. Uh, Og of Ashan is usually somewhere between 15 and 18 feet tall. And then you get to the early Canaanite scale. According to Amos 2.9, it says that they were as tall as cedar trees. Amos 2.9, as tall as cedar trees. An average cedar tree gets to about 35 feet tall. That's a modest tree. The cedars of Lebanon got to 150 feet tall. So I'm erring on the short side. So that's why I got the 24 to 36 footers there. 
And, you know, when you look into both the Hebrew and the Greek, it bears it out that we're talking about people of great stature. I'm not going to take the time to go through all this, but you can look it up for yourself. The Hebrew and the Greek words used there for their height. This is Amos 2.9, height as a cedar tree. And just to put it into perspective, <laughs> I, I love this verse, right? <laughs> Caleb, you know, they, they had just come back from the land and they described themselves as grasshoppers. Like, they're like, they're people of great stature there. We feel like grasshoppers in their sight. You know, and it says they, they sent an evil report. Well, the evil report is God said they could do it. God said, Go. I didn't have time to put in this presentation or to cover it here, but when you look at you get the name of the spy's uh, tribe, father, and, tri- uh, and the spy's name, I think. I think that's how it goes. There's like three names given for each of the spies that were sent into the land. And if you do the Hebrew word study on their names and the meanings, it's an awesome paragraph. I don't have it memorized. You have to look it up in my book. But uh, when you put that together, that's like it was a huge promise. God's like, got you covered just in the names of the people that were going in there. Chapter 13 continues on to list the names of the elders who were chosen to tour the land. Now, through the years, most of us have probably skipped over verses like these without much thought. However, now we are learning that these Hebrew names usually tell a story by themselves. Oh, cool, I haven't read this before, so I'm kind of excited to see where Ardell takes this. If you've been listening to our broadcast, you know that I love to look up the names too. And I've found that when you do look up the names... Uh, the Hebrew meanings of names, and there's a great book that will help you do that. It's called A Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names by J.B. Jackson. In fact, if you just Google that, there's uh, actually uh, an online version of it. Oh, as a matter of fact, I have it saved in my browser window. Uh, here we go. as a bookmark. So there you go. Boom. There's a link right there in the chat room for you to the online version of the Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names. And uh, what a great tool that is to have handy with you when you're reading the Scriptures, especially the Scriptures where you see so-and-so begets so-and-so and, and, you know, very specific names listed in very specific orders. Uh, A lot of times when you look up the meaning of the names, string their, their names together, the meaning of their names together in sentences and paragraphs, you end up with some pretty cool stories. And there's definitely a pretty cool story uh, in the meaning of the names of the Hebrew spies. but So let's see where Ard- Ardell takes us. These verses list by tribe the name of the tourists along with the name of their father. Now I want you to notice that the names of the tribes that are listed are not given in their birth order. And that's something else that catches your attention. It's a lot of times when you see the 12, the, the 12 tribes listed out, uh, the orders are different. They're not always listed in their birth order. And uh, I believe that the reason God has the uh, you know, Holy Spirit-inspired authors writing Scripture in very specific ways in certain orders is because there's a story there. There's a hidden code there. There's a treasure for you to seek out. The glory of God to hide a thing. The glory of kings to search it out. Uh, and here, they're not given in their birth order. This should be a clue that the names were written to tell a story. So that's a good place to, you know, a rule of thumb. If you if you don't want to look up like every time there's a name mentioned or every time there's names and genealogies listed, take note of when they're listed in different orders. Then you might go, hmm, maybe there's something there. First, let us examine the names of the tribes and their meanings. So we have Reuben, his name means behold the son, Simeon, hear him, Judah, give him praise, Issachar, he brings reward, Ephraim, doubly blessed, Benjamin, son of my right hand, Zebulun, dwelling with us, Manasseh, he will cause you to forget, Dan, judge, Asher, happy and blessed, Naphtali, strife, Gad, fortune and wealth. So in the order written, with very few words added, you can see Yahuwah telling you, to, quote, Behold a son, Messiah, hear him, Shema, give praise, for he brings reward, and you will be doubly blessed. He is the son of my right hand. He will dwell with us. He will cause you to forget your troubles when he returns as judge. Happy and blessed are those who believe. Though we will have strife in this world, he is our fortune and wealth. Now, uh, let's also take a look at the names of the chosen tourists to see if there's a story within the meanings of their names. Shemua, here, Shaphat, to judge, Caleb, like the heart, or wholehearted. Yigal, he redeems, 
Hoshia, salvation. Palti, my deliverer. Gadiel, L is my good fortune. Gadi, my good fortune. Amiel, L of my people. Situr, hidden, concealed. Nak, Nakabi, I hide, concealed. Guel, L is magnified or exalted. Again, here is the story with only a few words added. Taking those names as they are listed in the scripture, we end up with hear him for he will judge the heart. He will redeem me with salvation for he is my deliverer. My L is surely my good fortune. The L of my people has been concealed. Though he is hidden, he will be magnified and exalted. Now that's Ardell's take on it, um, which is very similar to my own take as I went and looked through these things. Let me see. I think I put this actually in the workbook, if I am not mistaken. Um, yes, I did. Um, in the introduction to the numbers workbook. Uh, now, Ardell it looks like he just had the name of the tribe's father and the name of the, let's see, what did he say? He said, let's see, let us first examine the names of their tribes. So he has the meaning of the tribes and the tourists, but he left out the name of the fathers because he had the meaning of the, it, it, when you look at that, Numbers chapter 13, verses 4 through 16, uh, we're given the name of the spy's tribe, the name of the spy's father, uh, well, the name of the spy's tribe, the name of the spy, and the name of the spy's father in that order. And so doing what you just heard Ardell do, I, I took all three of the names, the, the name of the tribe, the spy, and the father in the order that they're listed, and this is the story that it told me. See a son, listen and remember, listen to my noble judge, he shall be praised wholeheartedly, that's Caleb, he will be prepared. He will bring a reward, and he will redeem. Let him increase, for he shall be doubly fruitful to save for eternity. Son of my right hand, he will escape and be healed. Dwelling in God, his fortune, my confidant. Let him add forgetfulness to my, of my invader while I'm on my horse. Judge my people of God. My camel is happy and hidden. Who is as God? My wrestling, my hiding. Where have you vanished? My fortune is to exalt God in my poverty. Drawing out to save, Yah is salvation. And drawing out to save is Moses, and Yah is salvation is Yeshua or Yehoshua, the name of Joshua that Moses changed, Hoshea, to Yehoshua. So that's the full meaning. Now, the, the one little piece there that kind of tripped me up at first was uh, the line where it talks about in Numbers 13, 12, and 13, uh, the names there of my camel is the the name of the um, father in verse 12, and happy and hidden uh, is the name of the uh, tribe in verse 13. So I was like, what's the deal with the camel being happy and, hit, happy and hidden? And as I looked deeper into that, I discovered that the camel is actually associated with wealth. It's like a, a symbol of wealth. So it's saying that the, my fortune is happy and hidden. You know, it's hidden away. Nobody's going to get to it. In other words, I was like, man, that's just cool. Now, picking up in the Ardell commentary, certainly both of these groupings of names speak of the Messiah. It is interesting that Yeshua also spoke about hidden things in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Yeshua answered and said, I thank you, Father Adonai of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Now, Hoshea... Hoshea is quickly singled out for a name change. We see in Numbers 13, 16. There, these are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Yehoshua. We saw above that Hoshea means salvation. By adding the letter Yod to the beginning of his name, it becomes Yehoshua, meaning Yah saves or Yah is salvation. The rabbis teach that Moses anticipated trouble when he sent the spies and that he knew it would be Hoshea who would deal with it. Moses wanted to make sure that Hoshea would understand where his power and strength comes from, so he gave him a name that reflected this. I'm like, man, isn't that like the coolest thing ever? Names mean things. 
And so they go in there. Now, to be fair, if I'm walking around there, even if I saw that paragraph, I saw a bunch of these guys walking around, I, I'd have had some problems probably. I'm just going to be honest with you. But Caleb's like, no, pay, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. I'm like, dude. You know, and that poor guy, him and Joshua, right, they were the only two that took a stand and were ready to do it, but everybody else didn't, so God punished them, made them wander around the wilderness for 40 years. After they're finally able to go into the land, Joshua and Caleb are still around, but they're old guys now, right? They get to go into the land, and Caleb says, give me Kiriath Arba. Kiriath the city. Arba is the name of the father of Anak, who is the father of the Anakim that they saw. So here's, I don't know how old it is, somewhere between 50 and 80 years of age, and he's like, give me Kiriath Arba. I had to wander around with these guys for 40 years because they didn't believe it. I'm going in to take out the biggest of the biggest and the baddest of the baddest. And oh, by the way, when we're done with Kiriath Arba, I'm going after Kiriath Deber, which is really interesting to me. I don't, it means the city of the book. I don't know what the book is, but that's really fascinating to me. But he offered his daughters to any soldier that would help him go take Kiriath Deber. So Caleb meant business. <laughs> That's awesome. Father, give us the, the grace and the faith and strength of Caleb uh, in the days ahead. Pretty awesome. So when we look at the family tree, Noah, we said the whole world is populated by these guys. Well, we see giants, lots of them in Canaan's lineage. Uh, we see at least one in Mitzram's lineage and Cush, uh, one giant. And in Canaan, you know, the Amorites are the most notable ones that, that you see over and over and over again. Amos 2.9 again says they were the size of cedar tree, trees. The one giant in Mitzrayim is uh, Kaftor, and he's the father of the Philistines. The interesting thing about Kaftor is he settled the island of Crete. Well, Crete is where all of Greek mythology originates. Hmm, interesting. The one giant in Cush's lineage was not a giant by birth, and that is Nimrod. It says that Nimrod began to become a giant. And the word began is the same word used elsewhere for uh, sexual defilement, prostitutions, and things of that nature. So it's, it appears that through some sort of sexual ritual or defilement of some kind, he did something to himself and he began to change into becoming a giant. So you might think of something like Bruce Banner, right? He got doused with the radiation and he began to become the Hulk, right? Something happened to change Nimrod. Now, I didn't find any giants in Shem's lineage. That's good, right? Who comes through Shem? Yeshua, Jesus, right? And I did find some giants in Japheth, not in Scripture. I found it as I started looking into the historical record. And I mentioned this the other day when I talked about all of our presidents are related not only to each other, but to one guy, King John Lackland, the signer of the Magna Carta and the founder of the Lord Mayor Parade. They have every year in the UK that honors the Nephilim giants of Gog and Magog. And they march the giants of Gog and Magog through the streets. All of our presidents are related to that guy. Okay, and uh, another interesting thing happened when I was a missionary, I went to China, I got the privilege of standing on the Great Wall of China, look at all those little dots there, all those little, that's people, I mean that thing's huge, that thing's massive, it's really overkill if you're just trying to keep out six foot tall invaders, <laughs> thing's massive, and I came to find out while I was there that the, the Great Wall of China was originally known as the ramparts of Gog and Magog, they were trying to keep out giants. And uh, right about the time I realized this, Geico, ever see some of these Geico commercials? They're pretty funny. They show these, these guys that, that look like, you know, they're giants, and they come up on the, on the Great Wall of China. It's like this big, and they're like, hmm, what do we do? <laughs> right? And there's this other guy in the back. He's like, <laughs> he just walks out. I'm like, even Geico gets it. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> the ramparts of Gog and Magog.